We have our third speaker this morning. Is Lo, uh, her name is Lois Chan Pedley. The topic is breaking language barriers with multilingual sites. Please welcome Lois Chan Pedley. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Tiffany. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are on the um, together again on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Hamaskuyam, Squamish, Homeo, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. And um, whenever I talk with elders, they stress to me how important language is to their cultures, um, to the culture of the First Peoples, um, and really how important language is to any culture. Um, so I'm really quite honored to be talking about language at uh, this event today. Um, my name is Lois Chan Pedley. Uh, I'm a web dev with about 20 years of experience. I work a lot with WordPress Nation Builder. I also work with other platforms like Shopify and stuff. I graduated from UBC um, ages ago. It's not mega relevant here, but if you're from UBC, hello. Um, I've worked for the federal government where I built multilingual sites um, for several years. Um, and as an IT consultant now, I get asked to do a lot of multilingual sites um, lately. So I thought I'd be uh, sharing some of that information here. Um, you can find me at frontmatter.ca or at Fishtron on the socials, which I may or may not check, but there it is. So the question you might have is maybe why? Um, I went to Japan in uh, June with my family. Um, we collectively spoke very, very little Japanese, um, but we could get around just fine. Nearly everyone there could speak a little bit or very fluently in English. All the signage was in English and Chinese and Korean. Um, we did Duolingo for months, um, but we didn't really need to maybe. So. Um, why go multilingual? Why invest in that when so many people can read and write in English? Why don't people just click the little <sighs> Google Translate button and choose from like 100 languages um, that they so please? And why bother going into it? Um, so it's important to get to the why, because the why can drive your how and the how much. Um, and here are three big reasons why. The first one is called Can't Read, Won't Buy. It is uh, also the name, I mean, that sums it up pretty well, but this is also the name of a market research series uh, by CSA Research. They've been around since 2006 and have been refining their data um, and updating their data over the last 15 years. Um, they delve into the research habits of consumers and businesses alike, um, business B2B, business to business, and as well as B2C, business to consumers. Um, the last white paper is from June 2020, and here are some numbers that surprise even me. Um, the first one is 40% of people will not buy in other languages. Um, and if they're not proficient in English or that language, they're six times less likely to buy. So um, that means you're missing out on a, a large sector of people if they don't feel comfortable in that language that you're providing. Second number, 65% of people prefer content in their own language, even if it is poor quality. 73% people want product reviews in their language, if nothing else. Um, and these numbers are pretty clear uh, that having content in people's native languages is uh, pretty key to, con uh, to engagement and, um, and purchasing. Um, and uh, given these numbers, it almost doesn't make sense to not uh, translate your content to meet your, your client's needs. Um, I know for a fact that between my parents, my mom does all of the online shopping because her English is better. Uh, my dad will read uh, the product reviews and give my mom the download um, just because he gets a kick out of uh, reading product reviews in Chinese. Um, but if you can build a website that opens up his 
purchasing power or connect to him on some gut level um, in his native language, Chinese and Cantonese, um, more power to you. And reason number two is this crazy chart. Uh, this chart shows the top 10 languages used on the web. These numbers are from W3 Tech. Um, you can see English wildly dominates uh, content on the internet. Um, how many people can read or write? Oh. Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, I can. I don't know if there's mechanisms to do that through the conference, but I can also uh, tweet it out after the conference as well, for sure. Um, I, yeah, I was uh, wondering, like, how many people can read or write or speak uh, another language besides English in this room? <laughs> yeah, most, most of us. Um, and how many is, uh, can do that as their first language, as their, as their native language? Yeah, a fair, fair number of people. So that's wild because the W3 tag numbers shows that, uh, uh, and if you delve into it, that's um, predominantly American English content as well that dominates the internet. Um, and this chart, what that shows is that there's an opportunity for search engine optimization. So even with basic SEO hygiene, um, you can get ranked pretty well on search engines um, and um, if you think about most purchases starting with a search, um, that's, um, that could be a game changer for your business and uh, make a big difference for you. There's a bit of debate about the data and the methodology. Some people say their technique overestimates English, which I think it does. Um, Chinese doesn't even make it on this list. It's number 13. Um, and uh, that's bonkers. So here's another take from a different group of researchers uh, called the Observatory. They're from France. Um, but even here, you can see a pretty big gap between um, the two top Western languages, uh, English and Spanish. Um, and um, of course, Chinese macro and then Hindi and so on. Um, there's still a pretty big gap. So. Um, these numbers may be more reflective of the multilingual nature of websites themselves, even like a predominantly English website may still have components that are in different languages. Um, and um, these numbers will be good to keep in mind for, your, for developing your strategy of um, where you want to translate um, and how much you want to translate. So something to keep in mind. Reason number three is that Google and users in general don't like it if you're just copying and pasting your content everywhere, because that's not value add, that's not useful. But it's different if you write it in a different language. So essentially, you can have your same, same content, but translate it, and you don't get penalized for duplicating content. Um, and um, there's also other benefits, if you're multilingual, to writing out your ideas in different languages. Um, from a neuroscience perspective. There's lots of benefits for that, but that's out of the scope of this talk. So that's fun. Um, to recap, number one, the first reason is customers are far more likely to purchase or engage if you're connecting with them on, uh, with their native language, even if the translation is a bit spotty. And number two, there are fewer sites created in non-English languages, so there's less competition in organic search results. And number three, in Google's eyes, translated content's not the same as duplicated content, so you can put it out there. Great, so how are we gonna do it? One of the first decisions that you're gonna have to make is whether you get a human or a machine to translate for you. Manual or Human translations have the advantage of being more accurate. Um, we've all used Google Translate and found some pretty wonky translations of things. Um, so uh, with a human translator, that's less likely to happen. Um, and you can often reduce the cost of proofreading or eliminate it entirely. Um, you can get more nuanced or accurate translations 
um, where something sounds natural to a native speaker. Um, and this might be very important for you if you're uh, uh, presenting content for a cause where you want to connect with someone uh, on a deep and emotional level. Uh, however, one drawback is they can often take a while. You can only go as fast as your translator or your team of translators if you're going multilingual with multiple languages at the same time. I've heard of a uh, horror story of trying to manage a team of nine translators on nine different languages um, and uh, having a late game translation that all of a sudden, oh no, you have to track down everyone for one sentence, and that can be a challenge. It can be also costly. So if you're looking at an average of 10 to 20 cents per word, um, and often um, human translators have a uh, contract minimum, so you'll want to have to, you want to get organized and bundle up all your translations uh, and send them up rather than doing them on a piecemeal kind of basis. In contrast, we have mach machine translations. And I'm using the word machine and automatic translations interchangeably, even though they're technically uh, slightly different concepts. Um, automatic translation also refers to like the entire process from translation to proofreading to the publishing, um, whereas machine translation strictly just refers to putting your source content into usually an AI. Uh, and getting a translated content out of the other end. But for the purposes of this talk and most places, um, they're kind of one and the same. Um, here, automatic translations, um, the first benefit to using them is they're fast, they're instantaneous, available on demand. Um, the pricing is much more kind of predictable and a lot cheaper in some ways. Um, they're usually $10 for millions of characters. We're looking at about 10,000 words. So that's quite a difference from uh, having a human translator. Um, and typically, we're looking at like uh, a monthly subscription for, um, for services like DeepL, Google Translate, or Microsoft Azure. And um, they, are, they are getting more accurate. Uh, you probably still want a proofreader, um, which can then add to the cost. Okay, so then with your translated content, how do you make the site? If you need another language, does that mean you have to build a whole other site? Yes, yeah, sort of, that's the sort of short answer. The simplest thing that you can do if you have a simple site is just to spin up another site, um, copy your uh, whole site over, and then just swap out whatever content you have with your target language. Um, and that's something that's viable for a smaller site. I mean, you have you know four or five pages, and you only have to manage maybe two or three languages. That is totally doable to do all of that syncing up manually. But um, um, and conceptually, it's very easy for clients to understand if you're working with clients who has uh, content for an English site, they can just update it on the English site. If they have Spanish content and they want to change, just change it on the Spanish site and they don't have to touch the French site, don't even have to think about doing that. Um, and then any account of syncing up, you just do that manually and turn, you turn that into a human process of synchronization rather than a technical one. Totally doable for a small site. Um, however, if you have something a little more complicated, maybe you have more than a few languages, um, and, or if you have uh, e-commerce, for example, um, you'll want to look at plugins, which is why we're all kind of here, aren't we? So at a glance, um, all the plugins, there's, there's a fair, fair size market for multilingual plugins on WordPress. Um, and they can generally do all of these things. They can translate your theme, your plugins, for example, WooCommerce, uh, tags and categories, custom post types, no problem, um, SEO, and so on. You may need to pay a little more on the subscription to get some of these features. There may be additional setup required. I 
uh, yeah, some of the setup it gets a little more more complicated, but um, they can all generally do all of these things. They support right to left translations and some sort of automatic translation as well as manual edits. Um, ba -ba -ba. Um, and as you evaluate the plugins t for your own project or your client's projects, things to look out for are, does it work with your theme and all your plugins? Currently, they don't all work together. But they tend to work with the major themes and the major plugins. Okay, so at a glance, these are the ones that I've um, used. Uh, I'm gonna back up a bit. So these are all the plugins that I've used or extensively researched and compared. This isn't an endorsement of any of these. I'm not affiliated with any of them. Um, and there isn't necessarily like a breakout star of the bunch. They're just going to be what's appropriate for your particular project. Um, and um, choosing the right one depends, you know, you would still have to do your own research. But here are they at a glance. So for the first group, um, I've grouped them together, Polylang and WPML. They're more of the back end translators, what I like to call they're easy to conceptualize in the sense that they are, you get your English side, you get your French side, and then you go in on the back end um, and you translate the bits. Um, and uh, I find that for clients um, going into a multilingual site, which can already be very intimidating, um, this is easy for them to go, oh, okay, I can picture this site is this piece, that site is that piece, and I can do the pieces and they can manage it um, on their own end. Easy to train clients on. Uh, multilingual press, very similar to Polylang and WPML, uh, except it is compatible with and requires a multi-site. It is a, all your subsites are your different language sites. And um, this is great if you already have a multi-site set up, um, and then you can just have that on top, and then you can link up your, your different languages, so you can sync up the menus, um, and um, the challenge with that is it requires a multi-site, so if you're not on a multi-site, this would be, um, this could complicate your setup or raise your pricing um, hosting situation. Um, Translate Press is a neat one. It is a front end interface. Um, and um, there's another one that's also neat later on. Um, but yeah, you just go into site, you pick out the pieces that you need to translate. Um, and then on the interface, you can choose, I'm translating for French, I'm translating for Spanish, I'm translating for Chinese. And you can see at a glance, uh, all the different languages on, um, say on your heading or on your body content, what that would look like. Uh, that's very nifty. G Translate, translates your site with Google Translate on the fly. It's essentially the Google Translate button, um, uh, but you can, the advantage to using this is that uh, you can use the editor to edit your translated text if Google Translate kind of mess up uh, or give you something wonky. Uh, and lastly, we have Eat Weeglot, um, who is one of the gold sponsors of this event. Thank you. Um, it is a, uh, a translation as a service. You pay by the word count, whereas for the other ones, you pay uh, on a, a monthly or, or annual subscription. You license your site, and then you're good to go. With Weeglot, you pay um, by word count, and you can use one account for different platforms. For example, if you have WordPress, Shopify, Nation Builder. Um, those are all, uh, the, you can all fit them into your one account. Um, it also has a front end interface. Um, however, it stops working if you stop the subscription and uh, you can download your translated content, but your site will no longer function as a multilingual website. So big caveat on that one. Um, yeah, so these are all, um, these are kind of the major ones. There's some more free ones that you can poke into, but um, uh, these are generally kind of what I would recommend to the client to, to, uh, to compare for features and pricing and so on. Uh, I think 
these all, ex with the exception of WPML, have a free pricing tier. Um, so you can go um, and um, try them all out. And then number three, I'm looking at the time. Uh, the number three thing that I want to get into today, just briefly, are the best practices of doing multilingual sites. Um, I was talking with a group of people last evening uh, about kind of the state of multilingual sites in general and how challenging it is to manage multilingual sites uh, in this, which is surprising given how many of us are multilingual um, and yet on the internet. Um, websites are still a challenge. So the um, first thing that um, you will need to think about or you will need to get your client to think about is how much you want to translate. And here is where you will need to think like your customers, where are the key pieces that you want to see, um, where they will want to see information in their own language, navigation of course, product info, reviews and testimonials, how to contact you. Um, and check through the places where people will have heightened um, emotional responses. So just before hitting uh, purchase, for example, um, and or if they run into a problem on your forms, uh, the error messages, um, it's very off-putting when someone sees an error message that they don't understand and they're like, something has gone wrong and I don't, what is, don't understand what's gone wrong. Very, very upsetting. Um, so check through those things. Um, don't forget about information tool tips, important little tips that are like, when someone sees, oh yeah, there's a hint for someone that does not speak my language. Yeah, there's a hint for someone who, um, again, I don't understand what this is. Someone else is getting more information than me. That's very off-putting. So check through those little things. Um, next one. How do you know which languages you want to develop into? Um, three things here. First thing is ask your customers. Do you can do surveys, whether they're on-site surveys or uh, on, um, on your newsletters, if you have a, a mailing list. Um, you can check through your analytics for when people don't do what they say. Uh, you, can check, um, you can check for like the system language uh, of the devices that they're using, as well as you can check if someone's using the Google Translate button on your website, because the Google Translate changes your, your HTML, it changes through some cool JavaScript stuff. Um, and you can use analytics to track when someone does that on your websites. Um, and for the last one, if you're required to do it, then you're gonna have to do it. If you're part of a national organization or a government agency, if you serve folks in Quebec, if you're serving uh, people across the country, you're gonna have to have an English and French bilingual website. The next thing is a bit about the design of multilingual sites. So this is a quote from Josefa uh, Hayden Chamfosi. I'm gonna, I don't know if I got her name right. She's the ED of WordPress. Um, and this is from her WordCamp keynote. She says, what is the story you wanna be able to tell about yourself? What is the story you wanna be able to tell about your time with us in WordPress? And what is the story that you want WordPress to tell? Which is a great sentiment, um, good questions to ask yourselves at this uh, event today um, and to fit that onto a website in French it is about I think the average is about 33 percent longer in French compared to in English and then here it is in Chinese it's about half that size so when you're designing for a multilingual site from the UX point of view I'm not a UX designer but um, you're going to want to work with your designer on how are you going to fit, for example, all the menu items in the top nav. Um, I have worked on many projects where the French menu is getting squashed in uh, because we didn't think about the French menu, how they're going to look at the top. Um, maybe you need alternate translations. Maybe you need some special abbreviations. Um, and that's something that you're going to have to work with your translators to get. Um, 
and um, maybe you just need an alternate header design or an alternate call to action design. Another thing that happens a lot is in buttons. Uh, the text don't all fit on one line in a button. What do we do? Um, and so some of those things you're gonna have to wanna think about right off the bat. Okay, so a few more things that we wanna think about <laughs> and remember. Uh, you need a plan for all your translations. You wanna tie it to your calendars to um, routinely update your content. How many of you have gone to a, a, a multilingual site and you flip between the languages and you're like, oh, this one is it's definitely more up to date and this one doesn't have the updated content. That happens a lot. If you don't have a plan, your content will drift apart. Um, and then interesting thing about this, um, if you go back to the, um, if you go dig into the observatory data on um, web usage and um, consumer habits, people, um, sorry, it was actually from the Can't Read Won't Buy, my apologies, from the Can't Read Won't Buy report, people um, from certain areas of the world will prefer content in certain languages, but also if they perceive the site to be more up to date in that language. So for example, French nationals actively avoid Anglo-centric websites um, and they will, are much less likely to uh, make a purchase or engage on a website where they think um, the website is much more up to date in English compared to in French. So that's something um, that you wanna think about. You wanna keep your content up to date for um, general reasons, but also for a lot of kind of psychological reasons of, of your consumers, of, of your customers. Uh, second one is flags versus languages. I still see this a lot. Languages and countries are different things. So use language names or language codes. If I see a Canadian flag, does that mean English or French? It can be, it can be either one. I don't like seeing the American flag to represent English um, because I don't like it and that's, I mean, that's on me, but um, I don't like that. So um, the, the best practice here is to use the language name or the code. I know flags are catchy, they're colorful, but um, try to avoid that. Um, avoid text and images. Um, if you have some text in an image, make sure you're also localizing it or best just to avoid using them. Um, icon meanings, double check. They mean what you think they mean in target audience. Another story from Japan, thumbs up means good here. Thumbs up means good in Japan. Thumbs down means bad or don't like here. This means flipping off someone in Japan, so don't do it. Um, this is how you say no in Japan. You cross your fingers like this, this is no. So when you're doing, if you're relying on iconography to convey meaning, double check before you actually use it. SEO, it seems obvious, uh, but folks forget if you're, uh, especially if you're using a front end editor, um, it, you know, double check that your, uh, your Facebook share, uh, your cards and, and so on, uh, all your meta tags are, um, are up to date. Um, and lastly, you want to update your analytics setup um, because now you have double the content or triple the content if you're more going multilingual. So, and that's it, I'm at 29 minutes. Um, <laughs> I've shown you the, the why and the how, um, as well as some tips to uh, how to do a good multilingual site. Hopefully these will help your next uh, multilingual project go more smoothly. Um, and if you remember none of those things, that's fine. You're still gonna be doing a really good site, um, connecting with people, um, in their native language is a beautiful thing and we should all do it a little more. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, now is the, now is the time to ask. Uh, just a reminder that this will be posted online, um, so don't worry about the slides. Um, we have a question over there. Analytics. 
Oh. Yeah, so the question was about updating analytics and saying more about uh, how, how we would actually impl implement those changes. So analytics would be a bigger project. I could probably spend another full talk discussing uh, the changes that would go into there. The main things you want to keep in mind, GDPR compliance. Um, you should make sure your main site now is GDPR compliant. Um, for sure, but if you're going uh, working in a global market, you're going to need to make sure your privacy policy is up to snuff. Um, fun side note, Google Analytics is not GDPR compliant in and of itself. Something to think about, and um, I don't know if, you know, legally anyone's going to go after them at this point um, or go after you if you use Google Analytics, but that's something to think about and to make a judgment call about. Um, another thing is um, you will want to think about like off the back what your what your preferred setup will be. Um, there's some um, you want to keep it as simple as you can because all of a sudden you have like a whole fleet of websites to look after rather than just the one. And um, whether you want to have one property with multiple streams or set up individual properties for the individual sites um, or do a, a hybrid setup of, of having both of those setups so that you could have like an at a glance, a big picture with your one multi-site property um, and then be able to drill down into individual sites. Um, that's probably a really good setup. What you want to keep in mind is that if you have multiple sites, multiple streams feeding into one property, there is a cap on how much, like, I, the, what it's called is, is I, I don't know what it's called off the top of my head, but there's a cap to how much traffic it will look at before it starts sampling. Um, so rather than capturing all the traffic data, it starts just taking a portion of that so having separating them out into separate properties you can get around that and be able to drill down into your individual sites um, but you'll still want something to take a, you know, take a big picture look at all your websites hi thanks for the talk it was very very good um, one of our pain points on a multi-site, we French and English sites, is um, synchronization. So somebody hits, they're on an article, they hit the French button and they go to the home page instead of to the French version of that article. Um, and of course we have stakeholders internally who use that toggle button all the time and then they're emailing me, where can I find this article in French? Um, <clears throat> so I wonder if you can speak to that. Um, I believe all the plugins that I've mentioned can support synchronization. Actually, I don't know about G Translate because it actually just translates stuff on the fly. Um, so I'm not sure how the synchronization works there. I use WPML a lot, and that is um, you, you basically you link the pages together on the back end, and you can see bam, bam, bam on the English article, for example, you can see um, it's linked to this French version of the article. It's linked to the Spanish and the German and the Chinese version of the same article. Um, and the language switcher widget, the, uh, the Francais um, button, bad French, um, uh, that will go straight to the same article in those different languages. So it's a manual process that you have to put the links for? It, um, yeah. it can be if you want to change it up, but by default, it will be, uh, by default, it is linked um, if the setup is correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, and maybe something we can, we can connect on later on if yeah, you, exactly. if you yeah, want to, for sure. That'd be great. Uh, what about slugs? Do slugs matter? Slugs do matter. Well, How do you handle that? Good question. Um, slugs matter a lot for SEO. Um, and uh, again, all the plugins that I mention, um, they do uh, let you translate slugs. Um, some of them you have to pay like 
you know, pay for a subscription tier for like the free version doesn't do it, but then you can pay for a higher level one that does it. Um, but yes, slugs um, are important. Check your slugs, <laughs> guys, if you're translating your content. Um, you don't want to see about dash two for your uh, apropos page, for example. Yeah, hi. It's a, it could be a small question, but you know, what would you recommend if you are translating a, a web page? Would you want to open it on a separate window, or would you want to see it on the same window? Like same tab, or you want to open it on a different tab? If you click on translation. Yeah. Um, you mean translating? Do you mean translating on the back end? If I were the translator, do I? Um, so for an end recommend. customer, if my customer is visiting a website and sh the person wants it to be converted to, let's say, French, and if I click on French, would you recommend opening on a different tab or probably the same tab? That is a super good question. Um, I would say, yeah, my gut feel says same tab. Yeah. But I don't know if there's data that supports that gut feel. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I love it. There's like really good questions as well as good tips and tricks from the audience. And I think this is like the great thing because this area is such a pain point for a lot of developers. I would love to be able to talk to you all about tips and tricks, where, where you're struggling, where you have had successes, and that would be great. So yeah, to have this, this, is, this time is for you guys. I have, two, I have two questions, one about the websites and another one about YouTube. So about the websites is, uh, um, do you necessarily change the, if you, you want to translate, you use another page, or is there, is, there, is there any advantage to use another subdomain or domain for the English version? That's the first question. And the other one is, if you have a YouTube uh, channel and you have lots of followers, um, but you, have another, you know another language, is better to, to create a new channel or, or combining in the one that you have more followers? Oh, for you, okay, so I'm gonna go with a YouTube one first. That is a hard one to know. Um, I think the best practice for YouTube is you stick with your, um, you, keep, you keep your languages separate and you start, because um, that's your question, right? Like if you, if you start developing uh, content in different languages, do you create a new channel for all of those? Yes, um, I think that's the best practice. I'm not a YouTube um, expert and the YouTube algorithm shifts all the time. Um, but I, from what I've seen as a YouTube consumer, um, uh, that's what people tend to do. Your first question um, is about um, subdomains or whether you want to you keep it on the same domain and subdirectories. Both are good. Um, and uh, they, these days they both contribute to, um, uh, to SEO rankings and so on. Um, there's some debate about subdomains and whether they contribute to domain level authority. Um, I think for the most part, Google uh, does a pretty good job to balance, like if you have translated content i think they like they don't do they don't their their arguments against domain level authority is that for example like youtube has a wide variety of content like a lot of uh, sites with the same domain have a wide variety of comment uh, of content they don't want to have uh to assign domain level authority to the domain uh, just because it's so big um but for uh, like main people, like regular people's websites, I think it it does uh, it does play into how much authority, how much uh, your site gets ranked on the search engine, even if you use a subdomain to to publish your content. Um, these days, it's um, 
it's a bit of a cosmetic slash do you want to have um do you just want to have a, a good branding in uh, in your different languages um the like besides having subdomains the other thing is like just having completely different domains right because maybe uh your uh, english name doesn't make sense in uh in french or in spanish you want to have a french name um, and a spanish name for your domain and those are all pretty pretty much just the same as if you use a subdomain on your main english website domain or french website domain Not with the plugins. So if you're if you set up the plugins correctly with um, subdomains, so the question is about um, can you still synchronize, um, say your articles in English, French, Spanish, and so on, if you use a different subdomain or if you use different domains um, for all your different language sites. Um, and uh, my understanding is that if your uh, if your subdomains are um, and your different domains are set up correctly, the synchronization will still work. Right. Yes. If they're completely different sites, then the synchronization will not work. But if you set up, if it's the same site but translated, so that's the that's where the plugins um, really have that benefit um, of uh, maybe we need to, <laughs> to have a deeper conversation about this. If, you, if it's one site that is translated into multiple languages, but still within the same site, then the synchronization will work. Yes. All right. Yes. We have. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, and that, but that's where perhaps the multilingual press will be a good fit for if you migrate them all into a multi-site setup. Um, and then, yeah, so then you can use multi-site to sync that up. Yeah. Thank you, Lois. We have one more question, I think. And and for. Anybody else, don't forget we have social media where you can post your questions. It's hashtag WordCampYVR. Thank you. Uh, hi. When I came into the presentation, I was thinking mostly in terms of the logistics of changing text. Oh, yep. But you brought up a couple of things. The uh, button sizes. Clique ici. That must piss off francophiles. Um, web, uh, menu design. And you also mentioned iconography. What about color? In North America, we think of white color as purity. In Asia, we think of it as death. <laughs> uh, red is considered auspicious in, or, or uh, prosperity in China. It's a caution color here. What about those? That, what about the UX aspects of? That was, cr that was cringy. <laughs> that is a big question. What a good question. Um, that's where you hire a cultural consultant to help. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's such a tricky thing because I mean, yeah, even designing for with within you know our Western dominant culture, um, that you know, culture, the cultural significance of, of things plays such a big role in how people emotionally respond to uh, your website, your your piece of media. So that is that is really a really good piece to keep in mind. I don't have. Uh, an answer for how exactly you would do that, except for just make sure you factor in the time. Because I think time, um, the the schedule thing on the last slide um, is a big piece, uh, big piece of learning for for myself when I was doing uh, a lot of multilingual sites. Like have build in that extra time where you can to get those translations right, get those cultural pieces right, um, and um, don't rush yourself into making um, little, seemingly little mistakes that are um, that could be tough to fix later on. All right. 
Thank you so much, everyone. You've been a great, great audience. And I'd love to catch up with you about your adventures with multilingual sites. Hey, let's give Lois another hand of applause.